Okay, everybody, welcome back once again. Um, this is, I think, this is um, our third installment, maybe the fourth, of our 1920s lecture series. Hopefully, everybody's watching these videos from beginning to end and, and learning something in the process. You know, can't do it in, in class, and maybe that's a good thing. You know, we could, we could, um, even though they're only 40 minute long videos um more or less we could go into much greater depth we don't have the bell to worry about and tell us to go to the next class so like i told you last time um well we're gonna we're just, now we're gonna focus on some of the positive stuff maybe hernandez you know yeah we talked about the xenophobia and the nativism and the repression of uh political radicals, whether justified or not. Then we talk about the economy, both the truth and the mythology of it. Um, and the fact that the 1920s economy was pretty much uh, built on some flimsy legs. And we're going to talk about that when we get to 1929. But today, we're going to focus on uh, the social and cultural aspects more social of the 1920s so let's start with this premise in the 1920s was a contradiction of a decade absolutely on one hand you know in in our return to isolationism uh, some of the ugliest tendencies of american history pop up you know the nativism the intolerance the xenophobia um <clears throat> so all that is true um some of the lowest points in, in racism comes back up uh, not that it ever went away but it, um it, it it does take a dip for worse you know thanks to the emergence of the ku klux klan who themselves only emerged because they latched on to a, a longer list of grievances that mainstream America had, justifiably or unjustifiably so, and very conservative politics and turning our back on the progressive era and putting our faith back in business because business was doing so well. So let's put our faith back in business and, and, and keep that going. And if business does well, everybody else does well. You know, a lot of the, you know, almost articles of faith that we saw emerge mostly in the 1980s you know out of reagan the idea that if it's private it's better that you know markets are these unfallible things and believe in the market you know believe in those at the top the wealth creators and you know, we've been there before we've been there before um, nothing new it just you know they may change some words here and there but it kind of repeats itself so why do I say the 1920s were a contradiction? You know, very conservative politically, uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, you have some really pushing of the envelope on, in, in the social aspect of society. There's a tug of war going on in this country socially. We already, you know, we talked about politically. But there's a tug of war between those that want to turn back the clock to the way they think things were before which were better and the inevitable changing of society the inevitable you know, i'm going to use the word well i'm going to use the word the evolution of society society's changed they're not fixed things they're not static um yes absolutely a lot of it was the experience in world war one and millions of american men traveling overseas going to france seeing something different um and that itself you know triggering the imagination of many you know a lot of these social norms and values that are going to be pushed to a degree some of it comes from that experience in world war one but also a lot of it comes from things that were just happening here at home so it's a very strange tug of war between the new and the old the moving forward and keeping things back. Uh, a openness and a tolerance to new things. And at the same time, a very closed-minded intolerance uh, 
towards new things and it's going to be a process it's going to be a process both things are going to seem to coexist so let's look at, at one of those instances of that tug of war right something that had been a long time coming that once upon a time was actually seen as a progressive idea <clears throat> prohibition this is when it finally happens folks <clears throat> the 18th amendment and if you remember this goes all the way back to the late 1800s for the most part very religious women uh activists if you will in their own right in, in their minds progressive <clears throat> starting this crusade against alcohol in this country blaming just about every social ill on the availability of alcohol connect the dots and there was a strong anti-immigrant current to that it was the immigrants that brought this here this was not an american thing which was nonsense <clears throat> and, you know and i told you when we first talked about carry nation and and the uh, uh, anti saloon league and whatnot you know it, it seems funny haha <laughs> you know big but in reality these people these people are going to get into the heads of very powerful influential people and eventually they're going to get an amendment to the constitution the 18th amendment they absolutely do the third of the four progressive era amendments in this country from 1919 to 1933 is going to embark on a social experiment the hypothesis remove alcohol from society and all of the social ills of society will repair themselves and it ends up being a very uh expensive experiment but yes its roots are in social conservatives mostly religious folks a lot of them with a particularly anti-immigrant bent hoping to engineer out of american society um an improvement if you will they saw themselves as, as progressive if they eliminated alcohol so i believe it's in 1918 that Congress ratifies the uh, Congress passes and the states ratify the 18th Amendment, which would ban uh, well, right there it says uh, the sale, transportation, manufacture of alcoholic beverages. 1919, Congress passes the Volstead Act. First, you need the amendment, and then you need Congress to pass a law now that it's constitutional that would provide for the enforcement of this um of this new law of this uh of that amendment and that was the volstead act so americans are strong i'll just read off the slide americans of strong traditional and religious beliefs tended to support prohibition it was quite popular um when it first emerged and here's the irony despite the almost impossible difficulty of truly enforcing a ban on alcohol prohibition was the idea but anybody with a basic grasp on the basic science of fermentation and fermentation occurs in a gazillion things that we eat be it bread or yogurt or cheese you got a basic grasp of fermentation um it's going to be near impossible to to remove from society something that's been a part of society for thousands of years but that's exactly what we attempted to do the idea was get this out of society and think it's better um despite the difficulty in enforcing prohibition laws and the growing criminality and in, it was encouraging here's the thing take a product any product in which there's a strong demand for it. okay oh i don't know I mean think of anything cheeseburgers okay and then one day decide okay it's illegal you can't sell this stuff anymore you're gonna get in trouble you can't make it you can't sell it you can't bring it here but the demand is the same and if people have money and the demand remains constant guess what they're still interested in this what happens 
And we talked about we talked about this with the progressives. Every single vice that they eliminated, well, or they sought to eliminate and remove from society, the reality is they never really did. They simply put in the put it in the hands of individuals that were willing to take the greater risk. Arrest, prosecution, prison, okay, to bring that product to society. And that's the way risk works. Because they were taking a greater risk and could not provide society the quantities that you know that, that you could otherwise if it was legal. Well, because of lesser quantities and much more increased risk, um, it became very profitable. Okay, this drives up the price and therefore drives up the profit margins of all those individuals. And given that this is not a particular type of business that is governed by any type of government regulation, um, you are going to be attracting into um, this market, if you will, people that don't even respect the simple rules of civilized society. Um, you're going to be bringing in there people that <clears throat> could care less what the law says or doesn't say because the law doesn't apply to that particular type of business they're involved in. So you're bringing in people with a very gray understanding, if any, of right and wrong. And you're bringing in people that are going to hurt other people in the process in order to make money. And, and I don't know, we've learned this a million times, you know. You make prostitution illegal, you know, you're just going to drive these women into the arms of pimps. Uh, you make gambling illegal, and you're just going to drive the gambler into, you know, into the hands of the illegal gambling den and borrowing money from organized crime and, and, and so on and so on. But we tried the experiment anyway, and it didn't last long, okay? So right there we see a headline, House passes the dry bill over Wilson attempted to veto it. 176 to 55 to override president the president's veto so that tells you about the 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 divide between the president and at least the house of representatives he tried to veto this bill and they passed it over his veto which i imagine the senate did the same thing and um before you know it the 18th amendment it's passed, ratified, and then you have the Volstead Act. And now, from that point forward, it's the law and law enforcement across the country um, is duty-bound to enforce that law and to prosecute people that would violate the Volstead Act. And here's a picture of law enforcement dumping a barrel full of um, booze, if you will. It was to happen, okay? It was, you know... You have the cops going after the the traffickers and the manufacturers and the distributors, and it's a cat and mouse game. And the people involved in that business, there was even there's even a word bootleggers. Bootleggers, hey, where'd you get that from? See that picture down there? Usually, women were used as mules um, for short trips inside the city. And they, under their coats and under their skirts, quite often they could, um, I guess, they could smuggle liquor in improvised containers that, around their legs or under their skirt or under their, their, their coat. Sometimes boots themselves were fitted with a rubber liner on the inside that could be filled with alcohol. Sometimes a spare tire of a vehicle was used to... Well, look at that car. Okay, that that car was used. Um, it had this facade in the back that it was carrying wood, but in actuality, and that's all it was. It was a facade. It was used to carry, you know, liquor. So, you know, the same same type of tricks that drug dealers use today, they use back then. And <clears throat> essentially, you have a couple of things going going on. <clears throat> okay, so the Volstead Act makes it illegal. Number one. What happened to all the manufacturers, all the breweries? Um, I don't know how much of a wine industry the United States had at the time. You know, the United States did manufacture whiskey. We've been doing it since 1700s. What happened to them? Well, they either adapted to the new in, um, reality or they went out of business. A lot of um, a, a, a lot of 
there's a difference between fermenting beer and wine, if you will, and taking it even further. I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but if you want to go beyond, beyond 14% alcohol, then you have to distill. Okay, you have to remove the water can, content even more so. Um, distillation is the process, right? And it, it's very complicated. Well, you know, you, it, it, if, you're ta- if, you're, if you're doing distillation, you're talking about spirits with high alcohol, high, high alcohol, alcohol content spirits. Um, whiskey or was referred to as moonshine. So do we have manufacturers here at home? Yes. You know, usually in the woods, in the forest or what have you, they would have an illegal distillery, okay, producing moonshine. The term was because quite often they would work at night under the light of the moon to avoid detection, hence moonshine. And keep in mind, a lot of the stuff was not, it wasn't regulated by the government at all. So there was a very buyer beware element to it. You know, you could be putting something highly toxic or poisonous into your body if, if the manufacturer didn't know or didn't even care what they were selling you. Um, <clears throat> if we're talking about beer and wine, especially wine, you have to understand, this is almost impossible to control. Impossible to control. I mean, there's a picture there of, um, oh, so I forgot, before I leave this, you know, manufacturers, what, how did they survive? Some of them transitioned into manufacturing medicinal alcohol as an alcohol to be used in hospitals. Some of them, um, interest, some of the wine manufacturers got a license. There was still a couple of manufacturers that were still allowed to produce wine so long as they produced it for the Catholic Church alone. The Catholic Church was given special license that they were one of the few instances in which they could still continue to purchase wine for the purpose of mass communion. But at the time, they sold these bricks that were grape juice concentrate, okay? And people would buy these bricks, but it even said it on the label, okay? After dissolving the brick in a gallon of water, do not place the liquid in a jug away in a cupboard for more than 20 days because then it would turn into wine. It's giving you the instructions of how to turn this to wine, okay? A fruit juice solution, meaning there's fructose in there, was a type of sugar. They're skipping the yeast part. Once you tr- introduce yeast into that solution, the yeast consumes the fructose and produces the byproduct alcohol, okay? This is how wine has been made for thousands of years. So that part was uncontrollable. You couldn't control that. The distilleries, the illegal distilleries, they would find them from time to time. There was wine coming from the, there was liquor coming from the Canadian border and from south of the border. Um, across Canada, in Canada they made whiskey, so there was a lot of folks that would run whiskey. Um, from the Canadian border to the United States. Okay, so there was smuggling. Um, well, you, could, you probably know this one famous American family that would make a fortune, bootlegging, would make a fortune running whiskey across the Canadian border. And, 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 and we're looking at towns like, you know, Boston up there, um, even Chicago for a time. Detroit is the Irish that, that are pretty much making um, a fortune running whiskey. And to the south, namely out of Cuba, that's where the term rum runner comes out of it. In ships, they were running rum. They were running rum out of Cuba and the Caribbean um, to the United States. So, you know, you had you had trafficking, you know, smuggling behind, you know, beyond the border. You had, um, you know, transporting liquor in, in various, you know, invented vehicles and, and, and vessels. Um, <clears throat> well, another one that I, I forgot to mention, if you go to the, the Coors Brewery in, in, in Golden, Colorado, you know, you visit the brewery and they, and they tell you the story of, um, how did this company survive? Okay. So you have to understand a, a little bit of the process of making beer, the, the base grain material. Okay. When you're, pre- when you're, when you're preparing the soup-like solution 
to later be fermented to become beer has to do with um, barley. That That's the grain that is for the most part used, right? Malted barley. That means, you know, they spray the barley with water. They wait for it just to sprout. And then they, they stunt the process by roasting the sprouted garlic. Um, the spr- sprouted um, barley, if you will. Malted. They, they call this the process malting. Malt... Um, if you stop at that point, and if anybody ever drank malta, you understand, you, you already are familiar with the flavor. If you take the barley and you stop it at the point of just before um, sprouting and you go through the malting process, they would crush this into a powder. This is the, this is the powder called malt that people would put into milk. And then it was it was sold, it was marketed as having very nutritious qualities, etc. Well, a lot of these breweries survived that. Some breweries never survived. Some breweries survived by becoming medicinal alcohol producers. Some breweries survived by producing malt instead of beer. The Coors Company, that's what they did. And and, and there, there's, a, there's just a narrative out there that says that because the United States beer industry spent from 19... 19 to 1933 not making beer the end result is they actually forgot how to make it and they had to start from scratch in 1933 hence the very poor the 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 reputation of american beer being very poor quality um not that you guys need to know that but you know just historical but the beer found its way. It found its way into, you know, not just homes to be drunk privately, but it also spoke, its, it found its way into, um, I guess, what we would call bars. But bars were not legal. All saloons had to close. All bars had to close. So how did they survive? Through what was called the speakeasy. Very, um, I guess you could say, covert drinking establishments. They're almost like pop-up establishments. They could be in an office one week, and the next week they could be in the back room of a restaurant, and the week after that it could be in the lobby of a, you know, in in, in some uh, reception room. They found all kinds of ways to, to hide these places. And, and, and the nickname was Speakeasy. Like, don't talk so loud because you're going to bring the police, which in itself was a joke. The people that ended up running the alcohol business were criminals, okay? We could romanticize them all they want. They were criminals. And many of the officers that were supposed to be enforcing this law, maybe many of the judges, many of the local officials, were being paid off because they also, you know, were consumers of this product. And it almost became a running joke, you know, how impossible, for a multitude of reasons, it became to to, to, to truly enforce and prosecute anybody um, under the Volstead Act. And and probably the most famous of um, these individuals that made a fortune off of um, the booze industry, if you will, was none other than the famous, probably the most famous gangster of the 1920s, although he peaked in the 30s, Al Capone. Okay. So behind that picture of Al Capone, you have the police posing with a uh, a rather large quantity of alcohol that was seized by them. You know, some of these law enforcement, they took it very seriously. So Al Capone, and and it really, you know, it bothers me when I hear young kids speak admirably about this guy. Yes, he wore suits. Um, Don't let that fool you. I mean, I think we put more weight on the idea of wearing a suit today than they would have back then when everybody wore a suit. That's that, that kind of adds to the, the veneer of a respectability. Al Capone, long story sh- short, was, was was a thug. He was a thug. When he was young, uh, he ran the street gangs. He had a tendency for violent behavior. Um, um, I don't want I don't want to name family. I think I think he might have been connected to. Possibly the Gambino family or something like that. One of the five families of New York. Um, long story short, he moves up in the ranks. You know, these guys, they have their own society. You know, you're a soldier. 
and then you had your own crew and little by little um <clears throat> and they sent them to chicago um to squeeze out um the irish they were running the booze uh the booze game in, in chicago so al capone came out of new york but they sent him to chicago he's a he's pretty much a um a captain in, in you know in, in in a greater crime family that goes all the way back to New yes italian american but this guy was a thug he was a delinquent juvenile delinquent a thug it's not just alcohol folks this guy was involved in everything from assault to extortion to murder for hire to uh, extortion is like forcing small businesses to pay money for protection uh illegal gambling you know they would they, you know quite often to uh addicts of gambling they would be the lender of last resort but you don't want to borrow money from these people prostitution uh, they subverted many of the labor unions um so all kinds of criminal activity this guy was involved in you know and i love that people put him on a pedestal uh, the guy actually died of um, the latter stages of having contracted syphilis um there's a good possibility he contracted syphilis in prison um and he died i mean he's part of our local history here he does die on star island but by that time at that time you know he's um he's mentally impaired the syphilis has gotten to his brain by that point but that's not al capone in the 20s and the 30s and um so yes you bring people like al capone oh i forgot to mention the family that made a fortune smuggling booze across the the border up in the northeast into boston joseph kennedy and joseph kennedy used that money to build possibly one of the most influential political families in american history enough to pay the way for you know john and bobby and all of his sons to go to prestigious universities like boston and, and buy himself into a, a ticket into the reputable crowd of society but joseph kennedy was an irish mobster he was a bootlegger and he used that money to buy himself some respectability uh, a, a, a a a ticket into civil you know into respectable society and his children um on course one even became president of the united states so back to al capone i just mentioned joseph because i didn't want to forget in the end like many um <clears throat> criminals organized in organized crime they couldn't get anything on him not the violence etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know the one the people that actually get him here's the thing it's the sixth it's not the 18th amendment that does in al capone it's the 16th amendment which is income tax he was very flamboyant very extravagant with his wealth um he did a good job hiding most of his assets people would not dare rat out al capone but you know his bookkeeping was not perfect and in the end they got him for tax evasion it wasn't the fbi that put handcuffs on al capone it was the treasury department yes they have their own law enforcement agency and, and probably the the act that al capone is known for the most and that's kind of a gruesome picture for me to show you guys it is true um the valentine day's massacre uh, valentine's day 1929 which al capone eventually pushed aside his the irish mob competition george bugs moran out of chicago by gunning down about half a dozen of his associates sending a message if you will moran was apparently stealing a lot of capone shipments that were crossing the canadian border into the united states he was hijacking those trucks and so i guess this was a message to moran and his crew and um and al capone would emerge as the the, the crime boss of chicago so you know think about that about prohibition prohibition was supposed to cure the country of all sorts of things poverty and and, and criminality and and violence and then we have to reflect no it didn't it didn't and this country is not going to stop this experiment until 1933 
Let's talk about religion. Wow, so we spent 30 minutes on prohibition. That means we have to speed this up a bit. We talked about religion before during the progressive era. Uh, the social gospel was very much a part of you know, the progressive agenda, helping out the poor, putting the poor in the, in the center of one's faith. Um, not all Christians saw things that way. You know, you have your, pro, your, your the people that wanted prohibition, they were Christians also. But there begins to emerge yet another theological tendency in the United States because the United States has just f always been fertile, fertile ground for new churches and new denominations. Something about the water, I don't know what it is, but the United States has always been fertile ground for that. Um, <clears throat> mostly in rural communities, mostly um, among the lesser educated, um, the emergence of what's called fundamentalism. And fundamentalism exists in every one of the faiths. And it's usually, if you want the most simplified term, it's usually characterized with a very um, uh, intolerant, closed-minded uh, interpretation of, of faith. <clears throat> fundamentalism um, is basically this. The heart and soul of fundamentalism is... You look at the Bible, which is the written, documented uh, <clears throat> text that pretty much defines the, the Judeo-Christian faith of Christianity. And it is not a contextual reading of the Bible. It is a absolute and fundamental reading of the Bible. Every, there is no symbolism. Everything in the Bible, every word, every punctuation mark is the infallible word of God. It is meant to be there exactly as it's there. So one read, let's say you take the, the story of Genesis, right? That God ripped a, a rib from Adam. Well, first of all, just the story of Genesis. You have a lot of, you know, you have a, Christians say, okay, was that ever intended to be taken as a literal story? Or is it symbolic? Okay, is it a... Or how about even the idea that a rib was plucked from Adam and a woman was created? Was that meant to be taken literal or is that meant to be symbolic? Well, the fundamentalist takes it literal. That literally happened. Adam and Eve literally happened. That is true. The rib taken out to create a woman, that literally happened. There is a great emphasis on Bible prophecy and the end of the world. And punishment and hellfire for people that have sinned um and all all of the imagery everything that is said you know in, in revelations the book of revelations and that is to be taken literally so now you have the emergence of a of, of a new theological tendency in the united states that does not have a tendency of being very open-minded it is not very progressive in fact it is a reaction against progressivism and it is a no, literal reading of every word and sentence in the Bible, okay? Particularly in English, particularly the King James Version, all right? Um, and this begins, there, there, is a, there is a growing resurgence in fundamentalist religiosity in this country starting in the 1920s. You know, th this is the roots of today's evangelical movement. Okay. If today's evangelical movement and its existence today as a force in American politics goes back to Roe versus Wade, it's actually essentially what it is. The fundamentalists with the even you know the, uh, of of the 1920s, the movement that gave them form and shape was the issue of evolution. Okay. We're going to talk about that in a second. What helped fundamentalist Christianity gain popularity? Well, it was a recent invention by Italian invention, inventor Marconi, the radio. What did the radio do? <clears throat> to be a pastor, to be a preacher back then, you kind of had to...
you had your congregation. If you, if you were very popular, you had hundreds, if not thousands, if you were not that popular, but they were local. You were a local pastor, a local preacher. You had your local congregation. Some, some, some preachers traveled, and they did what they called revivals, and so they would actually travel from town to town and set up a tent and, and give services. And, and the fundamentalist style is very animated. It's very um, high volume. There's a lot of um, uh, fear mongering, if you will. There's a lot of uh, faith healing. There's a lot of telling people to repent that Jesus is coming. And if you don't repent by the time Jesus comes back, you are going to burn in hell forever. That's the style, okay? Um, which, you know, is typical of, you know, Certain tendencies in American Christianity. Billy Sunday and Amy Sempleton McPherson, very popular, particularly in the Midwest, particularly in California among formerly rural folks that moved out west. Um, and the radio helped them reach far beyond the local congregation, even far beyond the tent revival circuit to reach an even broader audience. So, this is the birth. This is, this is the great granddaddy of today's evangelical Christian movement. The fundamentalist movement, okay? That appealed to a particular type of crowd in America. It's even it still does. Um, and it was the radio that allowed them. Th this is the birth of tele-evangelism, but through the radio. Which brings us to this topic. This, this, I'm telling you, this is going to be a long presentation so as you all know, he was a contemporary of Lincoln. He lived at the same time that Lincoln did. Same birthday as Lincoln. Charles Darwin, um, naturalist as they called it. Um, I believe it was in the 1850s, 1860s. Traveled on the HMS Beagle to the Galapagos Islands. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be a science teacher here. But he proposes a high, you know, a, an hypothesis that changes the world. Okay? And, and it really doesn't start talking about man. He's talking about the origin of life on earth. And he says that based on what he has seen, okay, the hypothesis is that life on this earth started small and simple. And in order to adapt to its environment and survive, mutated here and there, picking up traits that would allow it to survive and went from simple and small to larger and complex. This larger and complex being the, product, the product of mutations that played out over hundreds of thousands if not millions of years. Mutations that were necessary either, well basically to survive in their environment. These traits were passed on to their progeny, etc, etc. And you ended up with what you have today. In the second book, this is the origin of the species. I believe there's a second book called The Origin of Man. He says that this process, human beings are also part of this process. Okay? Small mammals eventually became primates. There's a difference between a monkey and a primate. You should know this. Okay? Many of these primates, okay, stayed where they were, evolved no further, but man, or... Uh, Homo sapiens were the product of one particular branch of primates that evolved even further, okay? Further adapting to their environment. Long story short, highly offensive to people that believe in creation, and particularly the Adam and Eve story, that man, as he exists today, is the product of a very long process of what he called evolution. Uh, adapting and evolving to our natural environment in order to survive and passing on those traits that help to survive to our children and the species adopting changes over time for this. I mean, this is observable when you look at microorganisms. Okay? Why do you think, oh my God, a new virus? Well, how do you think that happened? Okay? It was the old virus that picked up a mutation to adapt and survive in, in, its, in its current environment and then you have a new, uh, forgot what they call, uh, yeah, a new version. 
Man works the same way. Okay, so long story short, oh my God, how could he suggest such a thing? I mean, Darwin had a hard time when he came back with the religious folks. Um, but little by little, little by little, um, individuals that believe themselves to be individuals of reason and science begin to side more and more with Darwin's findings. Okay, stop. So what does that have to do with American history? And folks, we're still fighting this battle today. It's Kansas. I forgot what city. It's a teacher, a biology teacher. You know, he goes through the textbook, you know, how did life come to be, how we come to be here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he decides to go off textbook, you know. Some of the more daring teachers have a tendency of doing that. So this is, I'm going to tell you something that's a theory that you probably haven't heard in church and you haven't heard from your parents and your parents don't even know. Okay? And the theory is that no, we were not created by God. We were, um, we evolved from a life form that was less complex than we are. And you could trace us all the way back to less and less, less complex um, life forms. Um, we understand this just shatters people's worldview, their cosmology of the universe and how it works. People feel personally threatened, and so the kids went home, told their parents, and the parents demanded that he lose his teaching license. Yeah, can't, can't tolerate that. Can't tolerate the teacher exposing students to ideas that the parents and um, who are probably not as educated as the teacher um, don't believe in. I mean, this is still an issue, okay? Um, and they asked for his teaching license, and they got it. But that wasn't the end of it. Uh, a little an organization that unfortunately the, those of a conservative tendency give this organization a bad rap. This organization has done way more good than bad. Uh, ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, decides to take the case of Mr. Scopes. Okay? Decides to take the school board to court Um to get Scope's teaching license back, saying that he did nothing wrong, okay? And this becomes, uh, you know, it's a little hyper, oh, the, the, the most famous case of the century, not the most famous case, but, but probably the most famous case of the 1920s. And it is broadcast on radio all around the country. The famous, tr the monkey trial of 1925 of whether school teacher, Mr. Scopes, had to write to expose his kids to something that um, their parents may not agree with, religious parents. It's, um, so here's a picture there. Um, wow, I wish I could remember the name of the, of the defending attorney. I know he was very famous and he's so famous, I don't remember his name right now. That's, I'm sorry about that, look it up. I will tell you who decided to take the case as the prosecuting attorney on behalf of the school board? None other than former Secretary of State and three-time former presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryant. William Jennings Bryant was a populist. He ran as a Democrat. He was a pacifist. And he was also one of this country's most renowned biblical scholars. And that's what he chose to use in his argument against um, against Mr. Scopes, the Bible. And long story short, Scopes didn't win. He lost his teaching license. But that's not the end of it. We are going to have this fight. We're going to have many Scopes monkey trials in this country for the next 80, 90 years. Evolution is still a reason why some parents choose to homeschool their children. They don't want their children exposed to secularist, uh, humanist, uh, rationalist ideas that don't necessarily gel with you know, the religious education that the children really receives at home. It says, well, listen, you know, the last time they tried to push this was with the idea of intelligent design. 
In a religion class, you want to teach creation, knock yourself out. Talk about creation all you want until you're, you know, until you're blue in the face. But in a science class, do creation stories, do creation myths have a place in a science class? Okay. The same as, you know, does science have a place in, in a religion class? You know? But a creation myth, of which there are many, does not have a place in a science class. And there have been many court battles, and this has been fought over and over again in just about every school board in this country. Um, and this was the first of them. And, and this is so 1920s. This is, you know, the old traditional um, America fighting against a newer, more modern um America that's emerging out of this one. And then lastly, oh, and by the way, before I, let's not leave William Jennings Bryant. Let's talk about our beloved city. We know that this city was founded in the 1880s as a town, but it's in the 1920s that things really start to skyrocket. And a lot of money that's coming into this country, and the banks are very willing to make loans at very low interest rates, Guess where that money is ending up? In Miami. Now, don't get crazy. When I say Miami, there's no Kendall, okay? There's no Westchester, okay? We're talking about a much, much smaller Miami. A Miami that ended pretty much maybe around 42nd Avenue, maybe 56, okay? Um, but it was growing. I mean, that's where Miami gets its nickname, the Magic City. Of how quickly it grew from a small, sleepy southern town to a larger southern city. Um, the suburbs at the time, I, I want to make you laugh. You know, this is the land boom of the 1920s. This is where you get all these great hotels in South Beach. They're built during the 1920s. Um, the Biltmore Hotel, Coral Gables. Okay. Places like Venetian Pool that goes back to the 1920s. The Biltmore Hotel that goes back to the 1920s. Freedom Tower downtown. Built by the same firm that built the Biltmore Hotel. Built by the same firm that built El Hotel Nacional in Havana, Cuba. All three buildings are sisters. The courthouse downtown built in the 1920s. Which back then we had a streetcar service that went all the way to like 50 something avenue. And why do I bring up Williams Jennings Bryant? Because after the Scopes Monkey trial, Williams Jennings Bryant relocated to Miami. That's why there's a Williams Jennings Bryant Elementary School. He was a good friend of George Merrick. George Merrick was a real estate developer that was trying, his idea was, I would like to bring well-off snowbirds to, after they retire, come and live in Miami because of the great climate. And I'm going to attract them by building in the suburbs at the time a housing community, a themed housing community. Kind of crazy. We're going to have houses of Spanish-like architecture, some houses of Mediterranean-like architecture. There was even some small experiments with like German architecture, even Chinese architecture by the University of Miami, but mostly it was Spanish. And the street names are going to have the names of places in Spain. And the guy that he brought to pitch this, to sell it, was William Jennings Bryant, who I believe lived somewhere around the Grove, which at the time was called Cocoa Nut Grove, not Coconut Grove. They never harvested coconuts in, in, in Coconut Grove. They harvested Cocoa Nuts. Okay, and the African American community that lived there was, you know, pretty much the manual workforce. So yes, our first real estate boom happened in the 1920s. Miami Beach, Coral Gables, Opalaka. Believe it or not, it was another themed community around like Middle Eastern themes. Pretty crazy. Um, Miami grew, and you, and you could drive around the city. You know, not Kendall, not Kendall. You drive around actual Miami, you have a good eye. You could tell a lot of those buildings built in the 1920s are still around. When you run into these weird houses, they have chimneys. Like, why in the world would anybody build a house with a chimney? 
in Miami. But yeah, they did. And the Biltmore Hotel is one of them. So all this came to an end in 1926 with the hurricane of 1926 that absolutely destroyed Miami's economy. And Miami would not bounce back until World War II. That was fun. All right, so let's do this in 10 minutes, which really deserves more time. Again, the old versus the new. The old trying to keep this country from going further and changing. You know, something funny happened when they passed the 19th Amendment to give women the right to vote. It changed. It changed a lot of women. A couple of things. Not you know, it, it's not just after World War Two. During World War, not in World War Two and Rosie the Bridge, but during World War One, a good number of women had their first experience in the workplace, having no other choice but to be the primary bread earners at home. Um, and that was something that became part of this new experience for the turn of the century woman. And then voting. Voting became a new experience for the 20th century movement. Well, you know, you add voting, suffrage, and in the workplace, and because of the expansion of high schools during the progressive era, more women going further in education. And before you know it, you have a movement. This is not the women's rights movement per se. It's it's the result of that particular women's rights movement, the suffragette movement that a number of women go beyond voting and having a place in the workplace and having a place, you know, in academia and really start challenging, you know, not at a level we're going to see later. This is the beginnings of a challenging of the norms and expectations that society placed on women as in this is how you should conduct yourself. This is what femininity looks like. This is what you're allowed to do in public, what you're not allowed. This is the future you should have. This starts to be questioned. Well, it started to be questioned years ago, but it starts to be noticeably and visibly be questioned in the 1920s. Okay? And a growing number of American women are are, are willing to challenge um, many of these norms Um going further than simply voting or working or staying longer in school. But we can't get too crazy because it only goes so far. A lot of this challenging happens more on the surface. It's not as substantive as it could be. So encouraged by the women's suffragette movement and the growing number of women in the labor force, the image and role of women begins to substantially change in the 1920s. Things become normalized that never would have been allowed. The iconic woman of the 1920s came to be known as Flappers because of a new, very iconic form of dress, very different than their mothers. Their mothers wore clothes shoes. Their mothers wore skirts until you know to their ankles wore long sleeves wore long hair that they tied up in the bun and their daughters had a very different visual style the hemline went up the hemline going up we also have to consider something and i've said this to you before and there's there's a good i could post a video online the the, the personal grooming it's already uh i don't know i call it a tradition but the personal grooming norm in Western society of women shaving their legs, I hope you know, is not even 100 years old. This is the first generation that begins to embrace it. I hope you know that half of the world still doesn't do it. Okay? And, and this custom came from France. Okay? American soldiers that saw French women practicing this custom brought it home, suggested it to their wives and girlfriends, and before you know it, it, as we say today, went viral and became cemented in, in, in our cultural norms, the wearing of makeup. Once upon a time, the only women that wore makeup were prostitutes. This is how they differentiated themselves from non-prostitutes, by painting their faces, hence the term painted ladies. 
Okay. Let's we'll read the slide and we'll talk a little bit more. The flapper was a liberated, rebellious young woman who spoke freely and dressed as she wished. Unequal to her husband and a valuable employee at the workplace. Nonetheless, the majority of married women remained housewives and women were still expected to observe strict standards of behavior. Was this every American woman? Absolutely not. Am I mostly going to see this in our cities, in our more sophisticated, open-minded, cosmopolitan places in this country? That's where I'm going to see it. Okay. And so here's some pictures to give you a better idea of how the style change and that style change gave way to an attitude change as well. Not just the shaving of the legs, but you notice fashion change. You see a lot of sleeveless blouses. Well, guess what? If you're going to go sleeveless, guess what comes the next? The shaving under the arms. Okay? This is all very 1920s. Cutting the hair into a bob. Um... The idea was to achieve a sort of almost boyish, dangerous look rather than the hourglass feminine look of the Gibson girl, which was, you know, feminine style at the turn of the century. So, I don't know if this, one of the first Miss America pageants happened in the 1920s, and it was in Venetian Pool. Okay, it was hosted in Venetian Pool. Um... So, you know, like they say, a picture can say is worth a thousand words. I mean, would I have found women dressed like this everywhere? No, I would not have. So we're going to finish with this slide because, you know, the the flapper, at least the image of the flapper. Uh, not that men were not dressing, you know, differently as well. But the image of the flapper, men were wearing like really, really baggy suits for some reason. That was the style in the 1920s. Understand, by the time we get to the 1920s, we already have a very early film industry. That lady that you're looking at there, Clara Bow. I mean, you don't you look at that picture, you don't think anything of it. But let me tell you, at the time, that picture was scandalous. Clara Bow was scandalous. Married several times. Uh, all sorts of lovers. I mean, that was something that was completely unacceptable in American society. She was the first starlet. The first Hollywood starlet, maybe even sex symbol, that starred in silent films. She was a, si a silent film star. And very much, she gave shape, She her role, she gave shape to the image, the icon of the 1920s flapper. But in the black experience, let's talk about one lady, Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker, if you were African American... And you wanted to be an entertainer. There was only so many options for you. Okay. Minstrel shows. Sometimes featuring African American performers. Sometimes featuring white performers. In blackface. Uh, were mostly. Um, I guess. Attempts at comedy. And much of the comedy was. Uh, self depreciating stereotypical uh, humor around stereotypes of african americans and so you know either music or comedy that was your options well like many african americans returning from europe in hearing about france she heard so much about france so many positive things about france she, she decides to give it a try and she goes to france and in france she actually has more of an opportunity to have a bro exercise a broader range as an entertainer than she did in the United States. In France, they're, they're going. It, it's strange because they're going through their their a period here. Um, exoticism, uh, obsessed, uh, a curious obsession with you know culture and societies and what's seen as you know backward places in the world, exotic people. Okay, well, she comes in, she, she shows up in France around this time. And she actually gets the star as a showgirl, a dancing girl, in a musical review show. And before you know it, she's the star of the show. An African-American woman in the 1920s is top billing. She is the star of this musical review show. 
And keep this in mind, in the 1920s, not only is she headlining in France, okay, but her feature signature act in that show is dancing topless in a skirt made out of bananas. And I don't want you to think how funny that is. I want you to think that that happened close to 100 years ago. And to what extent did that challenge shatter um, many of the restrictions that society placed on women at that time as to what was appropriate or not? Okay, She found fame in France that she never would have had in the United States. She found an attitude towards her in France that she never would have found in the United States. There's so much more to her story. Okay, she became a French icon, a star, a beloved star in France, even though she was born in the United States. And she toured internationally. She was a singer. She would travel all, all over the world. Her home was France. Um, she could never have children, but she adopted all kinds of kids from all over the world. Her rainbow tribe. She must have been married like three or four times. Um, world War Two. The Nazis occupy France. She uses the cover of, hey, yeah, I'm really American. I don't really care. I'm an entertainer. I sing. That's what I do. And the Nazis thought nothing of it. And they left her alone. And they let her go on tour and travel and sing with the understanding, oh, that's, that's a black American woman. We really don't have any reason to worry about her. She's just doing her thing. Well, you know what Josephine Baker was doing? The Nazis didn't know. She was working for the French resistance. The Nazis were so careless, they would invite her to their parties. She would entertain for them. And they would speak around her. Speak things that they should not be speaking openly, much less around, you know, somebody that's not a Nazi, a German. And on her tours, she would get this information out to the Allies. Much of the information that she was able to gather from careless Nazis around her not only helped the French resistance, but also was information that helped put together D-Day, the liberation of Europe. After World War II, she was recognized as a French hero. I think she was given the rank of colonel in the French army. And being an American woman living in France, the day she died, she was given a military funeral with full honors. And yes, she also shaped the image, the iconic image of the flapper in the 1920s. So we did an hour today. We talked about three interesting subjects, the social aspects of the 1920s, you know, religion, uh, and, and all of them represented a sort of tug of war, the changing role of women and, and prohibition. We'll do one more slideshow in the 1920s before we're done. Okay? See you next time.